Let's give her confession of faith. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. May our overseas believers also greet each other together. Let's become models of service. With this, today's message is entitled, Jesus Who Came as a Ransom. Today is the D-Day for inviting newcomers and short-term absentees around each main regional district. We'd like to truly welcome and bless all of you who are visiting Yewon Church for the first time today in the name of the Lord. There may be various reasons why newcomers have come here today. Some of you may have come because someone asked you to visit the church just once. Or some may have come voluntarily because perhaps you were moved by something. Or some might be here because you have a relationship that was hard to refuse with someone who had invited you. And perhaps some of you may have come at the request of a spouse, child, parent, or relative. And perhaps you had come without choice. Whatever the reason might be, there is something that you should not lose hold of. That is, that you are not here that you seated here is not a coincidence, but an inevitability. Whatever the reason might be, God has a special plan for you. And so God has various methods of salvation, but his method of having you here was the method that he has used for you. Jeremiah 1.5 states, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. And Ephesians chapter 1 verses 4 to 5 records, Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Those who are visiting for the first time may not be familiar with the contents of the Bible. What does the Bible, which is the Word of God, say? It says that God has planned to save you, and that was long even before the foundation of the world. Perhaps you may think that you've come here without choice or that you were forced to come here even though you didn't want to come. All of you were already predestined long before the foundation of the world to become children of God, to worship God. It doesn't matter what position, what character you have. You were already chosen before the foundation of the world. The Bible begins with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. However, even before that, God, even before... He, there were stars and the sun before the creation of the universe, even before the God had already planned to save you as a child of God. You may not be able to believe this. Perhaps it doesn't feel realistic. But once you come to believe in Jesus Christ and you receive grace, that confession of faith will come forth. Oh, God has saved a sinner like me, someone who is so useless and insignificant like me. How is it that God loves me and has saved me? I am sure there will be a day where you are deeply moved this way. It is such a tremendous grace. The more you come to know God, the more you come to church. Through your position, the more you carry it out, what do you feel? God loves me and has given me the greatest blessing of my life. And you will gradually come to know this from today onwards. 
What is the title of today's word? It is Jesus who came as a ransom. Why did Jesus come to this earth? This title contains the exact purpose why. Nowadays, it's almost rare, but there used to be many people who held signs that said, Jesus heaven, unbelievers hell, and it would stand on subway stations and people in crowded areas and would shout that. And people used to criticize them. They could just believe it quietly, regardless of whether other might believe it or not. Why are they making such noise? In the past, there was no internet or videos or cell phones like we do now. There were no tools for people to be able to share the gospel or hear the gospel like they, we do today. They had to either share Jesus through written documents or share the gospel in person. That's why in my young adult and deacon days, I did a lot of street evangelism. I would take the other young adults and share materials and documents on the streets in all regions of Busan where there were a lot of people w o u l d go and evangelize. And I'd also go into on a bus and I, it had to be a seated bus where we would go and evangelize. And then also in prisons, we used to go and share the gospel and evangelize to people who were imprisoned. And although today I'm preaching to you, standing before you, when I was a young adult, I was too shy to even meet people. I had a lot of inferior complex. I was too shy and afraid to look at people's faces. And, you know, I didn't like, I used to be afraid to even get on a bus. However, after my son's diagnosis with hearing impairment, And after earnestly seeking and praying to God to heal my son, I had visited many prayer houses all across the nation. And I, I didn't even sleep on the bed. And I, that's how earnestly I prayed to God every night. But the answer God gave me was to evangelize. And so as someone who was born in a believing family. What do you mean evangelize? Evangelism is f something for other people to do who were unbelievers and who had been deeply moved and changed and transformed. You know, what do you mean evangelize to a person who was born in a believing family for three generations? I did not like to evangelize and I didn't know what evangelism is and I didn't know, know how. And for people who've been in believing families for a long time, they're all kind of shy to evangelize. And so that's why I was hesitant when God told me to evangelize. But then when God gave me that, I became so passionate about evangelism to the point of turning Busan upside down and even the church that I was in and even the chairman of CCC, I would invite him and I would gather thousands of young adults in Busan and we completely overturned Busan upside down. And that's how I became so passionate about evangelism. evangelism. And so I, who used to be so shy, now became so confident and would go on buses. And I would say, I would greet people up front and I said, hello everyone, welcome aboard. The happiness of life is not, does not come from fame, power, and authority, and fame. Ask all these politicians if they bring, if that success, money, and fame brings them happiness, because it does not. Only the word of God can give you happiness. May you believe in Jesus and become children of God. That's what I used to say when I would board buses, and some people would curse me, and they said, "You know, why don't we go quietly? Why are you being so no noisy?" Usually, unbelievers don't even say that, but it's usually those who are in cults or heresies that would shout that way. I evangelized using various methods, but the core of it was always one, who Jesus is and why we must believe in Jesus. That's all I shared. 
through today's word. May all the short-term absentees and newcomers here today gain the accurate answer for your life. You don't have answers of your life, do you? You don't know how you need to live your life, what your purpose is, what your goal is, why you must suffer as you live life. There is no answer to that, is there? May you find your life's answer today. There are many religions in the world. But why is it that we have to only believe in Jesus? Why must we come to church having to go through this complex traffic and seats? Why do we have to come all the way here? You must realize the reason. And you have to realize the reason that you have to be born again and have that turning point in your life. May today be that day. Point number one is the reason he came as a ransom. Verses 42 to 44 read, And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. Every week I've been giving lectures with the book of Mark. And I think because I have been, I have had an overseas schedule, the, the passage that we picked up today is here. And so perhaps newcomers may have a difficult time understanding this, but it's occurring. So I'm sure you all understand it well. Today's passage shows the incident that took place on the road as Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem to bear the cross. Jesus lived as a carpenter up until he was 30 years old. And then his public ministry began when he was 31 years old. It was God's time schedule. So it took his three years for him to do his public ministry. And he was crucified on the cross when he was 33 years old. So after he had finished his three years of public ministry, this was the time when he was on his way to Jerusalem to bear the cross. Because he could only bear the cross in Jerusalem. Why? Because there it was filled with people who wanted to crucify Jesus. So he was on his way to die. And this took place while he was on the road on his way to Jerusalem. However, the 12 disciples following Jesus at that time were completely uninterested in the works of Jesus who was on his way to Jerusalem. Even though Jesus had already mentioned that he would bear the cross for all of humanity and that he would die and that he would, at that time, cross was something that people saw frequently because the crucifixion was a, a consequence for criminals. And so at that time, it was one of the worst sentences that a criminal could get on the cross because people would be crucified and just had to wait until they would die. Just as crucifying a frog on each of its leg and waiting it to dry up and die, that's kind of what the crucifixion was like for criminals. But at that time, Jesus already mentioned that he would be crucified, that he would die, but then he would resurrect Even though Jesus had said this many times, the disciples were not interested at all. Since beginning Jesus' public ministry, he performed many miracles and healed the sick. He healed the lepers and even resurrected Lazarus, who was dead from the grave. He performed many wonderful miracles, but it was not just that. But then with a small lunch of a young boy with that had five loaves and two fish he fed five thousand men five thousand men but it was only five thousand men but if we were to include and count all the children and women it he would have fed as many as twenty thousand people it was a tremendous miracle from the disciples perspective after feeding 5,000 men and perhaps 20,000 people, there was still food left over. And to commemorate this miracle, there, 
a church of the multiplication of loaves and fish is established. There is a commemorative church that's established in Israel. At that time, Israel was under the oppression of Rome just as our country was once under Japanese oppression for 36 years. And so because they were under the oppression of Rome, they had to pay taxes and had to be depraved of everything. And they were suffering from much oppression and exploitation this way. At that time, Jesus had appeared and was performing all these amazing miracles. The disciples so then perceived Jesus as a king who would liberate them from Rome and as one who would bring them to Jerusalem. They had these expectations. They were uninterested on the cross, and all they cared about was that he would become king with this authority and that he would finish everything that way. And when Jesus goes to Jerusalem, they thought that he would become the king and that they would liber that he would liberate them from Rome. That's all they cared about, that he would become king with this power. Of course, with that power, he could be king. And that was why, among the disciples, James and John came to Jesus without letting the other ten know and approached Jesus secretly and asked for special consideration. They asked Jesus, if you go to Jerusalem and become king, please let us sit on the left and right side of you. In other words, they were asking him to be appointed to the highest positions, left and right. And when the disciples, the ten other disciples, found out about this later, that they had that these two had approached Jesus quietly and asked him for a special favor, they became angry with them. James and John, who were proud to follow Jesus and who were proud to be closest to Jesus, had no sense of why Jesus came to this earth. They were not interested in that at all. And the other ten disciples were the same. The fact that they were very angry at James and John for secretly approaching Jesus meant that they had thought the same thing. They probably thought, oh, are you, only, are you going to be the only ones appointed to the highest positions? What about us? Should we be appointed the same? And the disciples' interests were the same as the people of the world. It was all self-centeredness, material centeredness, and worldly success-centeredness. It was Genesis 3, 6, and 11. Isn't that what the worldly people are? They're all centered on themselves. It's all about being centered on oneself and being centered on the materials and centered on worldly success for them to become famous. They had no interest in the spiritual things. People who live with these three things, even though they are in church, they are unable to receive grace. They are not interested in receiving grace. All they care about is what they'll become, how much they're acknowledged, and how, how much of a high position they get. That's all they're interested in. They're not interested in any other thing. Jesus was speaking about serious matters, but they were not listening to them because their interest was elsewhere. They had no interest in spiritual things at all. They had no interest. There are those who live, who have come to church all throughout their lives, but they have no interest in the spiritual things. They may know it, perhaps by knowledge, because they've heard of it, but they've never experienced it in their lives. There are many of, of you who are like that. Verse 45 reads, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. It clearly reveals why Jesus came to this earth. He did not come to be served like the disciples, but he came to serve. 
and it emphasizes that the greatest act of service was to be a ransom. Simply put, ransom means a sacrificial offer offering. And the reason why a sacrificial offering of the cross is needed is because of sin. In the Old Testament, sins were forgiven by transferring one's sins to an animal, such as a lamb, and sacrificing it. So if one had sinned throughout the week, they would come before a priest and they would give the animal they brought and the priest would hold, put, place its, his hand on the animal and by slaughtering that animal and, and scattering that blood on the altar, their sin would be forgiven. And so someone or something had to die for their sin. And because the shedding of blood was the cause of how sins were forgiven. And that is why many lambs had died back then in the place of the sin and the sinner. And so before Jesus came to this earth, that was the only method for, by which people could be forgiven. And so the other other nations were unable to receive salvation and only the Israelites were able to practice this and be forgiven of their sins. But Jesus came as a sacrificial lamb himself and as an atoning sacrifice himself. And why did he have to do that? In short, it is because mankind is a sinner. All mankind are sinner, even me who's a pastor, even the priest, even the Pope, even all those who even fast for 40 days in prayer houses, even all gangsters or prostitutes, all prisoners or police, everyone, every single human beings are a sinner. It says, for all have sinned. Most people think of crimes like robbing, murder, or fraud when it comes to sins. However, these types of sins can be solved by mankind. A person can serve a prison sentence required by the courts and be forgiven according to the law. They are forgiven that way if they serve their sentence. However, what is the sin that the Bible speaks of? Of course, those actions or committed sins are a sin, but what is the sin that the Bible speaks of? There's a fundamental sin, a sin that humans can never resolve. What is that sin? The greatest sin. Do not be surprised. But that sin is a sin of being separated from God. Originally, humans were uniquely created as spiritual beings in the image of God who were to be in fellowship with God, but they were separate from God, and the Bible calls that original sin, and this cannot be resolved by the efforts of man himself. It does not, it cannot be resolved by good deeds or kind acts. That original sin cannot be solved by that. From the moment babies are born, they cry. It would be nice if they were born laughing, but because they're born as sinners, they cry the moment they're born. This original sin. Originally, humans were the unique beings who were created in the image of God. Animals, in some way, animals are different and humans are different because humans were created in the image of God. And for animals, they can be caught and eaten, but humans are not that way. Humans, we are spiritual beings. We are spiritual beings. You keep considering your flesh to be important, but your flesh is not important. The moment it's gone, it's gone. Once it's cremated, it's done. Right? When people die, they're cremated, and all that's left is are their ashes. It has no meaning. But what is really important, it is the spirit. We are spiritual beings. And you've lived in your flesh, but you are spiritual beings. What are spiritual beings? To be in fellowship with God is what it means to be a spiritual being. To praise God, to worship God, to glorify God, 
our choir, it was so graceful, right? To praise God, to glorify God. What is the content of it? 10 million disciples led us to world evangelization. Is this something that unbelievers would hear? Even if they hear it, they wouldn't even understand what that means. It's only something that children of God know. But there's one promise. When human beings were created in the image of God, there was one promise. God, humans had been given an amazing ability because they were the ones who were creating God's image and because they, they were given the Spirit of God. And so there was something that animals could not do. They could build airplanes and rockets. Look at a cell phone. The, if you hold this one single gadget, you could do everything. And even if, if there are thousands of cars, our cars can, can find the way through navigation because that's an ability that God has given us. That amazing creation ability was only given to human beings by God. And because they are created in God's image, they have no limit because they have been given this creative ability from God. And to remind them not to lose sight of the relationship between the Creator and the creation, God made the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was not the fruit that was important, but it was the promise that was important. Do not eat out of this tree. If you eat out of this tree, you will die. You will surely die. Do not go against this promise. That was why God created the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, to remind them the relationship between the Creator and the creation. However, even though they were given a warning that if you eat out of this tree, you'll be separate from me and that you'll die. There was a being named Satan who was cursed by God. He was called Satan or David, and he had his followers. But he came and he saw that the relationship between God and Adam was so good, and he was envious of it. And so he came in between them and deceived Adam. He disguised as a snake, as a serpent and deceived Adam to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Try it. Your eyes will open and you'll be like God, he whispered to Adam. And Adam said, oh, but God said not, tell, God said not to eat out of this tree. But Satan said, no, if you eat, your eyes will open. And committing the sin of disobeying the word of God, Adam and Eve the moment they ate from the tree, because they disobeyed the word of God, they were separate from God and they hid from God because they were ashamed. And so at that time, they had no shame. But then because of sin, and as sin entered, now they had shame and fear. Before then, there was no such thing. Humans who sinned, could no longer be with the Holy God. And they had to be separated from God. As a result of sin, what came? The, the consequence, the wages of sin is death. There used to be no death. We were created to live eternally. But because death had entered, because sin had entered, death came. And that's why if you look at Abraham, they used to live up until 900 or 700. But after the f Noah's flood, only humans only lived up until 120 years and that's why people even though they live long they don't live as long as we used to be able to the bible all shows this the word of god shows us this as a result of sin spiritual problems mental problems physical problems mental hospitals are filled with patients but it was not just that but ultimately Humans became enslaved to the devil, and we do what the devil likes. We worship idols and head towards eternal destruction. And But this is not end in one generation, but it continues through the next generations. And next generations give ancestral rites and sacrifices. They don't know that ancestral sacrifices are given to demons, but they continue to do that. Generation and generation, they all perish. These are the six curses that come upon the unbelievers and their households. But the problem of original sin and curses is something that sinful mankind could never solve on their own. And that is why God, who is rich in love and mercy, 
presented a way for salvation, and he could not watch mankind perish that way. And that is why through a sacrificial offering to atone for mankind's sin, and because God is a God of justice, he required a price to be paid for sin, and that ransom was Jesus Christ. Jesus is his name, and for unto you a son shall be born, and his name shall be Jesus, the one who will save his people. So Jesus means Savior. And Jesus came to save. How? Through by being the Christ. And so Jesus is his name and Christ is his title. And so just as my name is Unju and my position is a pastor, Jesus was his name and Christ was his title. What did Jesus come to do? He came to be the Christ. You must understand this properly. Jesus means Savior and Christ means the Anointed One. In the Old Testament, what does it mean to be anointed? Only the priest, prophet, and kings were anointed. And they were anointed by the servant of the Lord. They were anointed by, in the name of the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But for Jesus to come to this earth and to have become the way to meet God, it was only possible through Jesus. And that is why he became the prophet. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is only one way. As the priest, he solved all the problems that were committed by all mankind. And through Jesus Christ, we were moved from the spirit of death to the spirit of life, to the law of the spirit of life. And he came as the king. What does it mean to be the king? He is the king of kings. The king of this earth is the devil. And that is why he has seized control of all politics, culture, and finances. However, the prince of this world is the devil. However, the son of God had come to destroy the works of the devil. He crushed the head of Satan. The reason the son of God came was to destroy the works of the devil. First John 3, 8, it was the word, it is the word of God. And that's why the prophet who, who has become the way to meet God and the priest who solved all our problems and the king who solved all the problems of my family and the spiritual problems is, and combining all these three offices, we call him the Christ. Christ is the solution to all problems. We have met God since I've been resolved, and He solved all the problem of the forces of darkness, of Satan. It is all finished, and that's why those who believe in Jesus, there are no problems. Even if there are problems, it is not a problem. And so even if there are problems, it's a Passover. Just entrust it to God. Jesus says, all who, you who are Heavy burden, come to me and I shall give you rest. To tell us I, it is finished. You, we are free. Do you have any concerns? You are being deceived. Do you understand? Oh, I have conflicts right now? No, you're being deceived. You, you are being deceived by demons and by Satan. What conflict do you have? What concerns do you have? What fears do you have? They're all deceptions of Satan. And that's why Jesus on the cross, the moment he took his last breath, he says, Tetelestai, it's Arab at that time. What does this mean? It is finished. I was born in a believing family. And I have never once left the church. I received all gifts and grace. And I would even speak in tongues since I was a young adult. And when I was a pastor, I would also drive out demons. And I graduated from the most conservative theolog theological seminary. And I was acknowledged as a good pastor. But you know what, one, that, what was one thing that I could not realize? It was this very thing. Matthew 16, 16, that Jesus is the Christ, the solution to all problems. I had never heard of that, even after having all those backgrounds. 
And that's why when you look at pastors in Korea, they try to use their heads, trying to use these methods and strategies. It is all finished. It is all ended. And who knows this? The Holy Spirit knows it, but also even Satan and demons know this, whether you have come to this answer or not. If you have not come to this answer, you've be you become a toy for Satan. Especially our young adults today. When you accept Jesus as your Christ, as your Savior, it is all finished and you're given eternal life. Your life does not end with death. Your flesh may die, but your spirit goes on to live. But it's only through Jesus Christ that you can be saved. And all your sins, your original sin and actual sins are resolved. And because one must have to die for all human sin, Jesus had to come because mankind could not do that. And so Jesus, being both God and man, fully came and he finished all sins. He it did not just end with his death, but it said that it is finished. What did he have to do? He had to resurrect. If he, one has died, he had to resurrect because th that's how eternal life is given. And that is why may you believe that Jesus died and resurrected. And so after he resurrected, where is he? After he died. And so where, what other religious leader could die and resurrect? And after he resurrected, he was with the disciples for 40 days. And he, all he talked about was the works pertaining to the kingdom of God. And he did not come as an offspring of a sinful man. We're all offsprings of man. But only Jesus came as the offspring of a woman. If Buddha were the Christ, we should believe in Buddhism. You know, if Buddha were the Christ, we should all be Buddhists. Buddhists. If Mary were the Christ, we should believe in Catholicism. If Muhammad were the Christ, then we should believe in Islam. We should be Muslims. However, these individuals were sinful humans. They were not God. They were all sinful humans. They could never be the Christ. Only Jesus is the Christ. Therefore, by believing in and accepting Jesus Christ, we are completely freed from all the curses of our family line, the fate and destiny. That fate and destiny that bounds us, we become completely freed from that. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. For whoever believes in Him shall not perish but receive eternal life. John 1, 12, For all those who believe and accept His name, they have been given the authority, the right to become children of God. And Proverbs 27, 1, When do you accept? Right now. Let us all close our eyes and pray this acceptance prayer. All you need to do is follow after me. And so if you follow after me, then just as air and oxygen goes into your nose and you breathe this air, can you see air? No, you cannot see, but the Holy Spirit works like this air. He's invisible, but he works at this time. May you sincerely and earnestly accept Jesus Christ if you desire to do so. When you follow after my prayer, then through your confession that you give with your lips, the Holy Spirit will go inside you and he will be with you and will be guide you forever. May you follow after me, Father, Lord Jesus. I am a sinner. I do not know where life comes from and what we do in our life and where it is going. And I've wandered and lived my life. But at this moment, I open my heart. Please come into my heart and be my Lord and Master. All the sins committed in the past and all the sins I'm committing in the present and all the sins that I will commit in the future. I believe that you have shed the blood on the cross and has forgiven all of them on the cross. From now until I go to heaven, please be with me. Thank you for saving me a sinner and for making me a child of God. I pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Let's congratulate with a round of applause.
This is how simple it is to receive salvation. It only took us seconds. God is Almighty. There's nothing humans need to prepare. Uh, washing your hair, taking a shower, it's all unnecessary. It's, all you need to do is believe and you are saved. And so if you believe in Jesus, then it's all finished. When did Jesus ask you for money, for you to fast, or for you to shave your head and do kind works? No. That's not what the child of God needs to do. All you need to do is believe. If you believe, it is all finished because God is Almighty. There's nothing He needs from you. And that is why if you have accepted Jesus and if you've followed after this prayer, then you have been saved. A child of God. Now, they, now you need to live with five assurances. Now, the assurance of salvation. Follow after me. The assurance of salvation. The assurance of forgiveness of sins. The assurance of the pray, answers of prayers. The assurance of the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And the assurance of the, of the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And so the devil may try to deceive you to have... to hinder you from having assurance you're being deceived and as you live your life you may commit sins and so the moment we open our eyes all we do is commit sins and so you don't have to be discouraged but if you re repent in the name of Jesus Christ you are forgiven when you confess with your mouths he forgives us once again do not be deceived from today on there will be those who guide you and lead you so may you be guided, surely. And second, it's the experience, it's the experience of the blessing of the ransom. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We have received the wonderful blessing of eternal life because Jesus became a ransom. The word ransom originally means the price paid to buy the freedom of a slave or prisoner of war or an atonement, paid to atone for the sins of the guilty. Jesus. And so that's how ransom originally was used as so that they could be freed for their sins, for their guilt. However, Jesus shed his own blood for all of our sins, becoming our ransom, settling all of our sins once and for all. Because of this amazing sacrifice, an incalculable sacrifice, we have been given the status of being children of God. Now, it is God's will and plan for us to realistically live out and enjoy the blessings of this ransom and this change of status. And because this is God's plan, we must not be deceived. And now that we have become children of God, we have been given three statuses. Now, first, it is that God takes responsibility of your lives. And because you're a child of God, God takes responsibility of you. Just as an American citizen, even if they were commit to commit something in Korea America protects them and America takes care of them and so because you're children of God even though you may live in this on this earth God is with you forever even though you may not be able to see it and that is called the indwelling of the Holy Spirit because you have accepted the moment you accept the Holy Spirit comes into your heart and stays with you forever he stays with you forever regardless of whether you come to church or not, He is with you forever. And if you don't listen, He might discipline you until you surrender and come to church. But th that would be such a harsh way to come to church. So may you just believe in Jesus well. And He guides you and directs your life. And most importantly, you can now pray in the name of Jesus Christ before God, and you receive answers when you do so. Follow after me. Before God, pray all your prayers, and then pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Then you receive answers. You have the privilege, the right to receive answers to your prayers. And now you can live in the world with the strength and power that God provides as a status of a child of God that in which God blesses you and guides you. And you've also been given four spiritual authorities. You don't live alone anymore now that you have accepted. And because the Spirit of God is with you, you receive the help of heavenly hosts before 
because you were not a child of God, you could, He could not really protect you. But now you have been given the right to receive the protection and help of heavenly hosts. And now you have the authority to defeat the power of darkness to cast out demons. I've casted out many demons. When you cast out demons, when you pray in the name of Jesus Christ, and demand them to cast out, uh, to be cast out. They listen, and now you have been given the citizenship of the kingdom of heaven. Your citizenship is in heaven, and now you have been given the authority and the status to do world evangelization. And the status and authority are given to be used. If a person has a driver's license but does not drive at all, the license would be called a closet license. Do not stuff it into a closet, but may you use it today on. And so use this authority in the name of Jesus Christ. There are demons. And demons are so strong that when our shaman team, when you follow them, you'll be able to see. At that time, Reverend Yu and there was Pastor Kim had brought these two, two sisters. And these two sisters, they looked a little strange. They had been demon-possessed. And so they, a shaman had told them to die. And so they had engraved they engraved they had they, whenever and so when when they whenever they would whenever the, they were demon possessed words that would say die 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 would have would appear on their arms but whenever jesus was proclaimed that letter those letters would be gone the moment you accept it is all finished the gospel is simple. All you need to do is accept. And now you, all you need to do is use this authority freely. The gospel is not information, but it is transformation. It's change and experience. And the church will realistically guide you to taste the blessing of transformation. All you need to do is follow well. Because when you follow, then you will unknowingly experience transformation and growth. Just as watering bean sprouts, it, even if the, it looks like the water is all gone, but the bean sprouts grow with time. Even at first, even though it may seem like you don't understand the word, if you continuously listen and come to church, you will, you're will you bound to become transformed. I'd like to congratulate all of you once again for to be, have become a spiritual family in Christ Jesus. And there will be individuals who will help you. Well, now from now on, may you not live according to your scale, but may you enter into God's scale. This is a conclusion. There is a Chinese idiom that says, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. Now you know who you are. You are a child of God. Now you know who your enemy is. You know who the enemy who brings you suffering is. Why do you have fights between your spouse? It's because there is a being in front of the devil that continuously tries to deceive you, to have unbelief even between you and your child and who gives you anxiety. These are all the works of the devil. May you bind Satan you have the power, the authority to do so. You have to interpret it spiritually. You have to interpret it spiritually. And that's how you can grow spiritually. Who am I? A child of God who receives salvation. Let's say it together. I am a saved child of God. Amen. So who is our enemy? It is Satan. It's not a person. And so stop looking at a person thinking that that's your enemy. You're being deceived. It is Satan, the head of the forces of darkness and also known as the devil and his followers, the demons. But the important thing is that even though they are invisible, they are spiritual beings that truly exist. It's not a ghost with white morning clothes or Dracula portrayed in dramas or movies, but they come into your thoughts. They come into our thoughts and tempt us and hinder us from enjoying the blessings of children of God and they attack us spiritually preventing our growth and they prevent us from doing missions and evangelism therefore all newcomers today there is an important principle to keep in mind throughout your lives it is to live as worshipers as saved children of God that's the only thing you must do as children of God you must take your life to worship you must know that you must come to worship to live you have to live a life as a worshiper because this worship must be the top priority in your life you need to gain spiritual power and receive the answer to fight a spiritual battle in your life's field through today's worship and the word proclaimed through the pulpit message may all of those who are hearing today's message in the name of the lord stand as complete worshipers lifelong and enjoy the blessing of li the life of Jesus and live a 
walk of faith. In the third service, a missionary, a Malaysia missionary, he's not a commissioned or joint missionary of ours, but through our elders, I was able to meet him. But he's such an important missionary who's doing missions in Malaysia, in the jungles of Malaysia. So I asked him to give a testimony about his missions. And in my opinion, he he was he is doing his ministry, doing his missions in the jungle of missions to where there are movies about him, to where he's also been on shows, on talk shows. That's how much he's devoted his life into missions. So I ask that you may come and hear his testimony. And so at this time, he will give us the med he will be giving us a meditation for the service. Let's pray, Father God. May all our short-term absentees and our newcomers today, each and every one of them, enjoy a new life and start a new life as they have been given the life of Jesus Christ. May all our believers and families not be deceived by Satan, and may they not fall into Genesis chapter 3, 6, and 11, but always live centered on God, the Word, and Church, and live centered on the pulpit. May they have a new resolution to do so. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.